So brothers and sisters, um, we, we've just sang a very beautiful arrangement in the form of a, a, a song by the, the Gettys and the Stuart Townend about faith. So in this song, according to these musicians, they, they try to chart uh, the role of faith throughout the uh, history from the faith of the Old Testament characters, which caused them to do extraordinary things for the Lord and for and to the faith of the prophets who prophesied the coming of Christ and to the faith of the early church who went to the nations. That's just um, looking at the story behind the hymn by faith. But our theme for tonight is faith. And through this faith, we too, as ordinary as we are, as ordinary as we are, we are able to do extraordinary things for the Lord. And there are indeed many examples for us in the scriptures in which ordinary men and women who did exactly that, extraordinary things for God. Now turn in your copies of God's Word to Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1. As we turn there, just to give you a background that in this second letter to Timothy, uh, his dear son in the faith, Paul is in an exhorting way. He boasts about the faith which is in Timothy. The faith which according to Paul in verse 5 you will see was in Timothy's grandmother Louise and was in Timothy's mother Eunice. And now this faith dwells in Timothy himself through Paul um, preaching as he was the, the one who discipled Timothy in the Lord. And we'll see that shortly as we go through the text. Now, this is the same faith which we sang about now, or moments ago, the faith which was in the Old Testament believers. And now, this faith is in me and you. And God has called us to a holy calling too. We have been called, we have been called to a holy calling. This is, a, this is the saving faith, of course. It is the belief in God's promise of salvation through the seed of a woman, the son of man, who is known as Jesus Christ. This, this plan of redemption was developed. It was developed and sealed by God before the beginning of time. And these are some of the truths about this faith and the description of this faith, which we'll see shortly in our study text, which will be from verse 8. Uh, but for, for, take, for context, we will read from verse 6. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we'll be reading from verse 6. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse Verse 6, let me read from, from verse 3. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Louise and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Now Paul continues in verse 6 and says, For this reason, now you can ask your question, for which reason? For which reason is Paul uh, given there? This is the reason in verse 5 that Paul is sure. He's sure and he's convinced that Timothy has sincere or genuine faith in God. Hence he can say the following to Timothy and we'll continue reading. And Paul will say, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. In verse 8, Paul will start saying, there, by therefore. So now we've moved from preposition, which was in verse 6. We've moved to a conjunction, which is so then, or therefore. So then, now here, uh, Tim Timothy, because of what Paul will say, Timothy, because of just what I just reminded you about faith, uh, 
and the gift from God. Because Paul is not, is not clear here about this gift of, of God that Timothy has and speculations around uh, among commentators will be that this was a gift of ministry only given to certain qualified men like Timothy. And it was given, if you remember, it was given to Timothy through the laying of hands by the council of elders. This is now in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. And Paul will continue, continue with that uh, conjunction of therefore. And, and moreover, because this is now Paul just adding what he would be saying there, why that therefore, and moreover, because you, Timothy, just like any Christian, you have this, the spirit of power and love and self-control, so then do the following. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. We began, verse 10, and when, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Verse 13, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Now that's our study text for this afternoon, verse 8 through to verse 14. And you'll have noted that it is a passage which is loaded with lots of truths. Now for our brief devotion tonight, to prepare ourselves for partaking in this table before us, we'll not fully expound on the text, but I'll observe a few of these truths with, uh, together with you. But I believe that the, the text gives you a believer three ways. It gives you three ways to be shameless of the gospel so that you may show your faith. Three ways to be shameless of the gospel so that you may share, you may show your faith. And the first being, you must suffer for the gospel. And that we see from verse 8c, to verse 12, you must suffer for the gospel. The second one uh, way is found in verse 13. You must follow the gospel. You must follow the gospel. You must follow the teachings of the gospel, verse 13. And lastly, in verse 14, we see that you must guard the gospel. You must guard the gospel. Now, Paul in a gentle yet strong fatherly manner, he exhorts his son Timothy not, uh, to not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Of course, the Lord here is in reference to Jesus Christ as he is the one who he refers to as our Lord in his benediction at the, be at the beginning of the letter. So Paul here he pleads with this young man not to feel shame because of this message which gives witness about Jesus Christ. It is in him, Jesus, if you know there in verse 9 and 10, it is in Jesus that Paul and all other Christians were saved from their sin and the punishment thereof which is death and were then called to a holy calling. And he himself, Paul, received this special and urgent invite by God to save him. The salvation and the calling did not happen because Paul, brothers and sisters, was a special individual. No. Paul was a blasphemer, a persecutor of Christians. He was a murderer. And we heard this morning in the sermon from Acts 9, which we'll also look at. Um, 
later. A violent man. Paul was, was an ordinary man. He labels himself in his own words, the worst of sinners. At best, a chief of sinners. But he was shown this mercy and was saved, not because of his works, but because of God's own purpose and grace. And that you see there in verse 9b. This grace was given to Paul in Christ. And this was decided before the world began. It is the work of predestination by our sovereign God. Through Christ, death was made ineffective. In Christ, death has no sting anymore. Its, its effectiveness has been neutralized. And believers, if you are in Christ, there's no condemnation. condemnation. Paul will remind you of that in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He will remind you even before that in chapter 7 that Christ died to save us from eternal punishment. We were delivered by God through Christ. Now you see, at the time of this letter, Paul is in, in a Roman prison cell, or he is in, 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 in a cell in, in Rome, and he is incarcerated for the gospel message which he and others preached throughout the Roman Empire, beginning or starting in Jerusalem. Now this message, this message of the gospel, which is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, it irritated the Jews. It irritated them to a point of them accusing Paul to the Roman authorities of all falsehood, all manner of falsehood, because they did not like this message that Paul brought to them. Now at this stage of his life, Paul's future is uncertain. He's anticipating that his life might end soon. And he says that in chapter 4 of the same letter, um, chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, he has created for himself enemies because of this message for which he says there in verse 11 of our text that for which he was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher. Then we can add the, a prisoner and therefore a sufferer, a sufferer that I think is clear in verse 12a. Because of his man out of life in the gospel, knives were out for Paul, if you like. Knives were out for him. En enemies wanted to finish him. And because of his current circumstances, which is th this one of imprisonment, some friends have deserted Paul. And he lists some of these friends in verse 15 of our text later on. And he says there that everyone in the province of Asia, including a certain Phygelus and Hermo Hermogenes, they deserted him. They all deserted Paul, the prisoner of Christ. So yes, he has, he's got no, no more, no more um, a long list of friends. And according to Paul, Despite his unfortunate circumstances, Timothy must never desert the gospel he preached. Before, because if he does so, if Timothy desert this gospel, it will mean that Timothy is turning away from life and immortality brought to light by the gospel. He must not even start to feel ashamed of Paul's situation because of Paul's involvement with the gospel. Because, brothers and sisters, for one to desert the gospel, it starts with one feeling ashamed of the message itself. If you feel ashamed of the message, then gradually you'll start pushing away those who believe that this message, those who preach this message, and those who are associated with this message. And if Timothy desert, if he deserts or the, the, the Lord or the gospel, it means that he is also deserting Christ. He's deserting Paul because or Christ because this message that Paul preaches doesn't belong to Paul, and we'll see that. And eventually, 
the person who deserts this message will desert the faith. This person will then denounce Christianity, will denounce genuine Christianity. Now, Paul doesn't want that to happen to Timothy. Hence, he commands him as ways to remain in the gospel. And you will see our first point here that he will uh, command him firstly to suffer for the gospel. He commands him to suffer for the gospel. Timothy must share in the suffering of the gospel. And in verse 11, Paul gives this young man, this young Timothy, a perspective of how the suffering works. So he starts by showing him this, the, the office to which he was appointed by God. Paul himself was appointed by God to this office, which is the office of preacher and teacher. And that office is still active in church, in our church today, which is the office of pastor, teacher, bishop, or elder, whatever you want to call it, it's the same office. And he was also an apostle. Now, this was a, a special one. He was a messenger of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and we see that in his greetings in the beginning of the letter. Now, this office, as I said, was a special one and was only exclusive to Paul and the other 12 uh, apostles. Now, you look at all these offices. These are honorable offices in the church and therefore carried enormous responsibility. Apostles were chosen by Jesus himself for the Great Commission. And this Great Commission was to evangelize the world for Christ. And listen to what Paul's mission was in Acts, Acts chapter 9. If you can turn there, Acts chapter 9. We were there this morning and we, we are back in Acts chapter 9. Now, this is after Christ met with Paul um, and obviously confronted him about him persecuting um, Christ. And as Paul was, was later then um, got blind and a message went to Ananias. So Christ, uh, Jesus then communicated with Ananias to tell him about this Paul. And it says then, verse 15, But the Lord say, said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And verse 16 there is very important. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. And that is precisely why Paul is now sitting in prison in Rome because he was to suffer for his Lord, Jesus Christ. And at this, at this stage, Christ's prophecy about Paul's life has now come true. And he goes on in verse 12, of, um, back to Timothy. He goes on in verse 12 to show to Timothy that even though he understood and knew his destiny of suffering, for the gospel. He did not become ashamed of the Lord Jesus, who himself was imprisoned unjustly. Do you remember? Christ was also imprisoned unjustly, and he suffered enormously. Now, Paul did not become fearful. He was not ashamed because um, of, of Christ's uh, situation, what happened to Christ. And firstly, see there in verse 7 um, why. He's not fearful. Similar to Timothy, Paul has access to the power of God, the spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. That's why he uses the, the pronoun us. Us, we are not given this spirit of fear. That's in verse 7. And then secondly, Paul is not ashamed of his calling, which is the gospel ministry, because he has a solid 
and unwavering faith in the Lord's ability to bring to fruition his promises to Paul. And this you can see, I mean, you'll see there in verse 9b. Because Paul knew that Jesus will guard everything about Paul. Because Paul was Jesus' appointee. Jesus is the one who appointed Paul for this ministry. And everything that Paul achieved was for Christ's purpose. It was, there's nothing. It was nothing for Paul's ambition or goals. It was not about Paul. This was for Jesus' um, purpose and plan. Including Timothy's calling and ministry. It is all for Christ. So all Paul's ministry belongs to the Lord. As we saw then in Acts that Paul, Christ said that Paul is just an instrument for the gospel. Now, for, to, for, for Timothy not to be shameful of the gospel, he must perform his honorable calling himself too. He must actively proclaim the name of Christ. He must witness about the Lord. He must join Paul in his mission of suffering for Christ. I think we just recited in our in our covenant that we will endeavor to make disciples of our families, friends, colleagues, and so on, so and so and so forth. Now, at the time of this writing, it is believed that Timothy was in Ephesus when he received these two letters, which is First Timothy and Second Timothy, and this is where he needed. This is the place where the Lord placed him. This is where he needed to con continue suffering for Christ, which was to share the gospel with others. Now, not only was Timothy commanded to suffer for the gospel, but he's also commanded to follow the gospel. He's also commanded to follow the gospel. And this is the second way of remaining shameless of the gospel. You must follow the teachings of the gospel, brothers and sisters. It is another imperative that Timothy must implement in his Christian walk, and he must follow the pattern of the gospel. And Paul says there, the pattern of the sound words that he heard, that you heard from me. Now that's another evidence that Paul discipled Timothy. He taught him the elementary principles of the Christian faith. And now Timothy's Timothy is expected to hold on to this. To hold on to what he learned from Paul. He must pay close our careful attention that he follows the example or model or a model set for him by Paul. So while he's proclaiming the gospel, he must proclaim the true gospel as he heard from Paul. He must proclaim the true gospel as he heard from, from Paul. Timothy must not teach his own, his own gospel because Paul's gospel was entrusted to him directly by Christ. Christ met with Paul and he gave him this gospel directly. It came from the Lord himself. Now this command to, uh, to Timothy to follow the, uh, um, the, the sound teachings of the gospel, it comes at the back of a warning from Paul to Timothy about false teaching which was in Ephesus church and Paul addresses that uh, false teachers in chapter 2 of the same um, a book. There were those who had swaved away from the truth and started preaching false gospel. So Paul wants his son to stay in the gospel truth and to follow exactly what he learned from him so that he does not disqualify himself from this holy calling that has been given to him. 
Now lastly, for Timothy to remain shameless, he must guard this truth handed down to him by Paul. And that we see in verse 14. Timothy must guard this truth handed to him by Paul. So believers, you must guard the gospel. Your duty is not only to believe it, but you must also, you must hold it closely in your custody. That's the definition of that word, guard. You must defend it against false teachers. You must correct this falsehood, this false gospel when you come across it. And later on, we'll see Paul showing uh, um, Timothy that scripture is for that. It's for correction, for rebuke, for instruction. So you must use the scripture to correct false doctrine. And in the next uh, chapter, chapter 2, Paul will then give Timothy uh, practical ways to do so in the next um, chapter, as I said. But it, it is important to know that the gospel is not ours, brothers and sisters. It does not belong to us. Hence, Paul says to Timothy there that he must not be ashamed of this testimony about our Lord. Not testimony about, about Paul, but it is testimony about our Lord. Important that he starts first with the Lord and then he, um, he tells him about himself not to be ashamed of the Lord's prisoner. It's not even using his, his name. So this gospel does not belong to us. It belongs to God. And the Holy Spirit who dwells in us will help us with this task of guiding this gospel. I think that's the point that uh, uh, Paul makes there in verse 14. Now that's our brief exposition of the, the verses in verse Timothy. I mean, there's still a lot that we can extract from that, but just by way of observing, that's uh, things that we can see from uh, this uh, chapter about the faith. But how do we apply this now in our lives? So these ways, they teach us, these three ways, they teach us that all genuine Christians, regardless of the office in the church you hold, you must suffer for the gospel. So none of us is invincible to suffering, to this type of suffering. A pastor will suffer for the gospel. A member of the church will suffer for the gospel too. In fact, suffering, for, uh, um, suffering is one of the greatest equalizers, if you think about it, among genuine Christian. It's something that should be common among us. And that's a proof that in front of God, we are all equal, regardless of our positions or offices in the church. Although pastors will be the ones severely hit by suffering, as they would normally say that the tallest tree catches the strong wind, pastors as leaders or shepherds will have to face some situations head on to protect the sheep from that. But all of us will not be spared from suffering. So whether you are a student, whether you are a young professional, whether you are a parent, you must proclaim the gospel verbally. You must proclaim the gospel by your life, wherever you find yourself. Even when you get discriminated against, even when you get labeled as being backward or not progressive, or whatever label you might you might get, you must suffer for the gospel. It is your duty to defend it from those who are abusing the gospel. If you come across those who are abusing the gospel, it is your duty to, de to, to guard it, to defend it. But be wise on how you defend it. Paul will also tell uh, Timothy not to be involved in bubbling and um, all those things that are, which are useless or waste of uh, time, but just be wise on how you're going to, to guard the gospel. But for you to do so, you should also be equipped yourself 
He must know what the gospel entails. He must know what the gospel entails, what the true gospel entail, entails. That's why it is imperative, it's very important that you come to the meetings of the church to come to learn. Be here in all the meetings of the church. It's very important for you. You do not have to be extraordinary brothers and, uh, uh, and sisters to show your faith to others. We heard this morning that God saved you when you were not special, when you were nobody. And you must save him because you are special to him. That's why he decided to save you. He has set you apart for his plan. That's that word being um, called. He, he has set you apart for his plan. And lastly, we also learn that there is no shame in gospel ministry. There's no shame in gospel ministry. In fact, it is an honorable task to serve the Lord. It's not a shame. It is an honorable task to serve the Lord. So, amen. I think those are some of the things that we can take away from um, this text. But let's, let's rise to sing our second song, the Compassion Hymn, and then we'll move on to the communion. <laughs>